Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. And I'm glad you joined me for the second week of studying the book of Colossians. The study book we're using is The Fullness of Christ. And uh, I pray that if you would go by the church, you can borrow a book. It's Colossians, The Fullness of Christ. That's the study book. And you can watch these lessons and then you can read the lessons there in your book and it can help you to grow in Christ. You can also order these books from Baptist Way Press and then you'll have your own personal copy to keep at your house. That's a good way to build a library and to benefit you uh, not only now, but later on you go back and read it again and gain, gain new insights about God's word. Uh, would you bow with me for prayer? Dear Lord, we're thankful for another day that you've given to us. We ask you to guide us in our study of your word. And Lord, we know that these are not idle words made up by mankind, but rather these are words coming from your heart. And we're thankful that your Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul and all the writers of the Bible to record what they did. And they had no idea we'd be reading these, you know, in, these, in this day. Had no idea. It was for a particular place, a particular church, they were writing these letters. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we can understand what he was saying to them and interpret it for us today so we can live for Christ each day. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in last week's study, in the first study, we, we learned that um, the Apostle Paul had started the church in Ephesus and lived there from 53 to 56 AD. And then uh, we know he sent out missionaries or, or apostles out from him to spread the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the known area. And one of these places, of course, we learned was Hierapolis and Laodicea and Colossae. Um, and as a result of doing that, churches were established in these places. One of them being, of course, the Christians in Colossae. And that is why this letter is called the letter to the Colossians, uh, because it's an established church in Colossae. Now, we need to remember that this, while Paul was in Ephesus from 53 to 56 AD, uh, he, was, he was put in prison in a Roman prison around 60 AD. So it's about maybe four years later that Paul wrote this letter back to the church at Colossae that he did not ever attend, but he knew was started through one of his disciples, Epaphras. Now, when we see this, we find this in the letter over and over again. He mentions the name of Epaphras uh, because he was like their um, pastor. And he heard that Paul was in prison. And so he traveled, of course, by foot and then by boat over to Rome in Italy. And there he met Paul and talked to him and told him about the things that were happening in Colossae. It was then that Paul wrote this letter and then send the letter back to uh, Colossae. And also that letter circulated over to Hierapolis and Laodicea. So all three churches were able to read this one letter. Now, Tychicus was the one who wrote the letter back. And we find that in chapter four, verse seven. And as a result of this, he was not like, um, could he could not FedEx this letter overnight to the Colossians. It was all being done by parchment in a sack, in a leather bag to protect it from the weather, the rain, the weather and all that. It traveled back by ship, then by walking and riding in wagons back to the city of Colossae. So it's just amazing to me that the letter survived. And uh, we'll find later, later as we read the last chapter of the book of Colossians, there is another letter Paul wrote. He actually wrote another letter and it was to the uh, Laodiceans. And what's interesting about that is that that letter has never been found. So wouldn't it be great if somehow they could find that letter? But that just shows you that of all the letters Paul wrote did not, were not preserved over the years or perhaps were destroyed uh, by fire or water or whatever, or lost. Uh, and so we're so thankful that we have the letter to the Colossians. Now, last week, you remember, in verses 1 through 8 of chapter 1, Paul says he is the one who wrote the letter. He told them he was praying for them. And then he reminded them in verse 6, all over the world, all over the world, he wrote, in verse 6, 
This gospel, the good news, the story of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is bearing fruit and growing all over the known world, just as it has been doing among you. So the word of God, the message of Christ, the gospel, the good news has been growing in them. How exciting can that be? He recognized that. And he heard it first and understood that God's grace and all of its truth. You believed this because what you heard from Epaphras. And now he has told us about you and about your love for Christ, your love for me, and the love of the Spirit. Now, it was at that point in verse 9 of chapter 1, Paul continues his letter. So you look with me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Are you ready? Here we go. For this reason... For this reason, since the day we heard about you, how did Paul hear about them? He heard about them from Epaphras. From the first day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. Paul is saying this, this to the Christians in Colossae. He's not, we have not stopped praying for you. In other words, since the day Epaphras told Paul about them, his heart was open to pray for them and to help and pray that God's spirit will guide them and lead them. Paul had not stopped praying for them. Now, I want to ask you a personal question. What effect do you think Paul saying he had not stopped praying for them, praying for the Christians in Colossae? What effect do you think it had upon them when they read these words in his letter? They could probably turn to one another and say, did you hear that? Paul's been praying for us. When we make it personal, we ask ourselves the same question. What effect does it have upon me and upon you when someone tells us, I'm praying for you, and they pray for you? What effect does that have upon us? Of course, it's a powerful moment. It's heart-rendering. It draws us into a closer relationship with others. When someone tells us they're praying us, praying for us on behalf of us, that they're lifting us up to God in prayer. We begin to sense immediately that we matter to God and that we matter to that person. And we experience a new energy and new power in our thoughts and in our steps. I believe Paul knew that from his own experience of life, he had heard it said many times to him as he left, Paul, we're praying for you. As Paul ran from one city to another, being chased by those who hated him. Paul, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. Don't you know, don't you believe that in his heart, Paul had the experience of people praying for him. He knew what it meant to hear those words. And that's why he says it here. Christians praying for other Christians always lifts their spirits and strengthens their faith. It's a powerful reminder of the love God has for them and also the powerful love that others have for them. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that when we pray for others in the name of Christ, it gives power to them, gives encouragement to them. It helps them to face their anxieties and worries and fears. I believe it works. I believe it happens. It happens for two reasons. One, we pray. Never minimize, ever. Don't ever minimize your prayers for others. And secondly, it matters to the people we're praying for. And know what? I believe it matters to God because he sees our heart more than anything and how much we love and care for others when we pray for them. And when Paul wrote the word we, he was meaning, of course, himself and all the people with him, who some were who were in prison with him and some who were visiting, visitors to the prisons bringing food to them. It was Paul, Epaphras, Tychicus, Onesimus, he says, continually asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. He's praying for them to always be filled with knowledge of the will of God. 
and understanding of God's will through his spirit. Isn't that a powerful word? That's what he's praying for. Paul knew that the main objective in life is the follower of Jesus Christ was to do the will of God. I believe that is what our main objective is to you. As followers of Jesus Christ, he didn't save us from our sins just to enjoy our salvation for ourselves. He saved us from our sins to bring us into his family and to set us on mission with a purpose just as he sent Jesus into the world with a purpose and a mission. Would you agree with me that our main objective in life is not so much to make God listen to us as it is to make ourselves listen to God? Would you agree our task in life is not to persuade God to do what we want, but find out what he wants us to do for him? I wonder sometimes if we try without realizing it to change the words of Jesus from thy will be done to my will be done. It reminds me of two brothers who wanted to go down to the creek to fish. And the mother says to them after they ask, can we go fishing? They said, uh, she said, no, dinner is almost ready. And I need to have you here to eat it because I want it to be hot when you eat it. And about 10 minutes later, the boys, you know, they go outside and they're standing around and said, look, it only, we can go down there and fish for a few minutes before she calls us in for supper. And she would never know. I wonder if maybe sometimes we're like that. We ask God to reveal his will to us. And then, of course, God does that. He reveals his word to us, his will to us. And we can know his will by reading his word. People say, I only wish I knew what God wanted me to do. Just open the Bible and start reading, brothers and sisters in Christ. Just start reading. Start reading the Gospels. And hear what Jesus said. Start reading the things that Paul encouraged the church to do. To love one another, forgive one another, show mercy to others, care for the poor, care for the widows, care for the orphans, care for those who are around you, love. Give what you can to all that come who have needs. You want to know what the will of God is, just read his word. But you know what? We, we sometimes read it and then we forget it. Well, like what the book of James says, the book of James says, James says, we uh, look in the mirror and see we have a problem, we need to comb our hair, wash our face, and but we walk away and forget to comb our hair and wash our face. What we need to do is when we ask God to reveal his will to us, we need to be sincere about it and then follow through on what he tells us to do. Would you agree the first objective of prayer is to seek the knowledge and will of God? Well, Paul prayed they would know the will of God. Well, look what else he wrote. They prayed for him to be filled with the knowledge of God's will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Now, why is that so important? Do you remember years ago when you gave instructions to your children in some matter and they would ask, why, why, why can't I? Why, why won't you let me do this with my friends? All my friends are doing it. And then we would answer the question. We provided to our children what is known as, quote, critical knowledge. Critical knowledge helps a person make decisions based on correct information. Critical knowledge helps people to understand and to make a good decision in the days ahead. Telling, telling a kid not to play with a rattlesnake is one thing. Telling a kid not to play, play with a rattlesnake because if it bites him, it will kill him. But with the venom it has in its teeth and its body, that's critical knowledge. Oh, I get it now. I don't know about you, but the place I love to gain critical knowledge is not from Hollywood. I just don't, I don't watch TV to learn critical knowledge. I don't, I don't watch Hollywood Squares, and I don't watch all the movies people play in and listen to their comments about any issues in life. Very little do I listen to anything they have to say about any issues in life because 
they don't have the complete picture. They're being paid to say 99% of what they say. So why would I listen to someone who's a movie star? And I don't listen to news all the time and everything that's being said there and all the politicians. When everybody's speaking from what they can gain or whatever they say and trying to get me to think and do a certain thing. No, when I want to know critical knowledge from, from day to day, I look at the world and then I look at God's word. I had a professor in seminary, Dr. Henley Barnett, wonderful guy. He taught Christian ethics. He said, fellas, I want you to know that when you get up trying to figure out in the morning what you're going to preach the following Sunday, I want you to do this. Read the newspaper and then read the Bible. Read the newspaper, then read the Bible. In other words, find out what's going on in the world and then bring messages that are current and relevant based upon what God's word has to say. Listen, the bottom line to life is the critical knowledge we learn in God's word. And you see here, Paul was praying the Christians would have wisdom and understanding based upon the critical knowledge and the great truths of the Christian faith that he had taught them over the years. Paul then gave his reason in verse 3. Look there if you would. He listened, He listed several benefits. Verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Now look at that. Notice he did not say that you need to have critical knowledge so that you may have a life worth living, a life better than your neighbor, or that you can be proud of what's going on in your life. No, Paul underlined the simple truth as Christ's followers, if they compared their lives to others, you may have to have more money, a property, or education, then you'll never have the long of your life. You'll always be empty on the inside because you never can match your neighbor. You can never match those around you. In fact, it would be a life of worry, constantly trying to outdo others. Instead, Paul motivated them to live their lives worthy of the Lord and pleasing him. Now, I think we all realize uh, no one can be like Jesus. In the strictest sense, you are absolutely right. No one can be like Jesus 100% of the time. Why is that? We're all fallible. We're all sinners saved by grace. But listen to this. God's not a bit surprised that we're sinners. And don't you think it's odd that God would send Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, then send us on a mission for Christ's sake into the world? Was that a mistake God was making? No, he knew he was dealing with fallible human beings who would have the gospel in their hearts and they would have to be forgiven over and over and over again for the stupid things that we do and say. And as a result of that, he would nourish us. We would learn from that experience. We would grow in Christ and we would share our experiences of faith and our mistakes in faith and learning that through Christ, there's hope and peace. Christ understands all of our mistakes. He understands we're not, we're not perfect. God gets that. That is why he sent Jesus to forgive us of our sins. God, what God wants us to do is to stay constantly in tune with him and his Holy Spirit to guide us in everything we do, in our thinking, in our attitudes, and in our decisions before we open our mouths or take action. Have any of you ever said the wrong thing to someone and quickly muttered under your breath, well, open mouth, insert foot? Yeah, sure, I've done that. We all have. What do we call that? Well, we call that instant remorse, instant regret. Why did I say that? Why did I keep my mouth shut? Why did I let that come out? Well, I believe the reason we have that instant regret is because we're in tune with God's Holy Spirit. It's God's Holy Spirit who prompts us to say to ourselves, oh Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, I pray. I'm so sorry I said that. Oh Lord, I'm so sorry I acted in that way. That's God's Holy Spirit prompting your heart. 
And that prompt comes about because we know in our heart the right thing to do, but fail to do it. When we first trusted in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it was God's Holy Spirit who came to live in our hearts and guide us each day. And what is God saying to us? He is saying, slow down. We all need to slow down. Slow down our quick responses, retaliations, and thoughts. Slow down. This is not a battle of winners and losers in life. We need to slow down. And I'm talking to myself here. We need to slow down and let my spirit, God's spirit, guide our thoughts, guide our emotions, and guide our actions. God says, slow down. I want you to live a life that is worthy of the Lord in every way. You see, when we allow God's Holy Spirit to guide our thinking and our feelings and our actions, we bear the fruit of his spirit. That's what Paul was saying here. He wanted them to bear the fruit of his spirit. We can't bear the fruit of God's spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We could not ever bear any of the fruit of the spirit without God's spirit living in us and our obeying that spirit as he teaches us. Look now, verse 11. He says, we are being strengthened with all the power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. We are all, being, we are all growing in strength and power of Christ. We are all beginning to learn to endure and have patience. So how did the Christians in Colossae live a life that would please the Lord? Did they flex their muscles and walk around strutting around everybody and showing how smart they were? No, they didn't do that. He said they'd be strengthened with all the power according to the glorious might of Christ Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because not, God never gives us a command or a job to do, a witness to bear, or a sacrifice to be made in our own strength. If that was the case, we would not need God. And we could do everything God wants us to do without needing him, then why God? The reality is we need God because we're not God. We need God's help and guidance because only he is perfect. We need God's help because we are not perfect. We are weak. So we need to ask ourselves and do as he says. God never gives us anything to do without providing the strength and wisdom to do it. And that's so important, isn't it? Because God knows if we attempt to live for Jesus and carry out our ministry, our mission of serving him all on our own, we'll become tired. We'll want to quit. We will become impatient with everyone around us. And we certainly will not act and live like God wants us to live and act. I remember when I was in seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, I became the pastor of the Center Hill Baptist Church out way out in the country near Vivi, Indiana. I remember after preaching one Sunday morning and evening and driving back to Louisville, and I was pretty discouraged. It was a small church, about 45 members that would attended, had a total of about maybe 75 members. So we had half the congregation there, but nevertheless, a very small congregation, a beautiful building and all the rest, but just not many people there. I walked into our apartment and sat down and began watching Mission Impossible. Remember that program a long time ago? If you accept this mission, you know, uh, it's an impossible mission, then great. But when the mission, mission, when this tape is over, it's going to self-destruct and it would it disappear. Well, I was watching that one night, one Sunday night, and uh, I remember telling Nan, I just came home from Mission Impossible, and now I'm watch watching Mission Impossible on TV. She started laughing. But then, but then I was reminded by the Lord's Spirit, Jim, this mission is not impossible. It's impossible only because you think it's impossible. And this mission is not about you. you, you you're saying that you're impossible. And sometimes you are impossible to yourself and to everyone around you. But Jim, I want, to know, I want you to know something. You're my mission, and you're not impossible. And the mission that I've given to you. It's not impossible because I am with you. 
and I want to help you to grow. I want you to grow and learn to endure in this trying time. And Jim, I want you to learn to be patient with people. Wow. I suddenly realized for the first time what God was saying to me. I was on mission, but in reality, God was on mission in me to teach me to be the kind of minister and person he wanted me to be. He wanted to be a person who, over the years, would endure challenges from all kinds of folks who come to church and all kinds of challenges in the world. He wanted me to endure, not get wasted because of some unkind person who said something to me following a worship service. And I'm so thankful that God helped me to have that message of endurance in my heart. And then to be patient. Have I been patiently perfect? No. I have been many times impatient and not perfect. But God has taught me over the years that he's in the growing of Christians, not me. My task is to feed and to water, but God always provides the growth. As a result of that, I've learned from the Apostle Paul that this is God's number one mission in us. And Paul wrote about it right here in the book of Colossians, that we'll be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. I believe God has worked in my life in a lot of ways, but learning to be more patient with people has been a challenge. And I have to be confessing about that. It's even challenging today, being patient with myself and being patient with others. And what I am, that, my friends, is the fruit of the Spirit. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. That's Christ, God's Spirit, living in me. That's what Paul wanted the Christians in Colossae to be, be toward each other. Endure and be patient. That's what Paul was experiencing in prison. He had to endure the prison, the chains, the sorry food, the cold weather, everything else. He had to be endure it and be patient with those he was writing to. And then Paul wrote in verse 12, I'm also giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here, Paul reminded them to be joyful and thankful to their Heavenly Father for the opportunity to serve Him. They would share the spiritual inheritance God's holy people have always had in the kingdom of light. God is Jesus. I mean, Paul was saying to them, you have a wonderful, wonderful inheritance because of your faithfulness to God. I cannot help but wonder if Paul was thinking about his confrontation with King Agrippa that's recorded in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Paul told the king when King Agrippa was challenging him, and then finally Paul said he was sent by God, but with a purpose. He said, God sent me to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I, was, I believe Paul was saying four great things in this one verse. Without God, first of all, mankind gropes and stumbles as if walking in the darkness. In other words, we really don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we need to do. We don't know where we're going. A Christian martyr Christian Morta once wrote, when Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, he said, it was like the dawn breaking on a dark night. When Jesus Christ came into the world, man, mankind was groping for purpose and meaning, direction. And when Jesus came into the world, he gave purpose to every person who followed him. The only way our lives have purpose and meaning why am I answering the questions? Why am I here? What does God want me to do? Well, the only purpose we have is in the light of Jesus Christ to give ourselves back to God and give ourselves in serving others 
through the light of Jesus. Secondly, we find this passage means we've been transferred from slavery to freedom. The word we like to use is redemption. It's a big churchy word. But it means basically someone has paid the price to set us free. You remember this is exactly what uh, Jesus did for us. Without God in our lives through Jesus Christ, we stay slaves, remains as slaves to our fears. We remain slaves to the gods of this world. And things become hopeless because our fears and our worries and the things of this world can never give us purpose and meaning. In Jesus Christ, we find the bonds, the chains have been broken and we have been set free. We've been set free from our sins, our fears, and our hopelessness. Jesus Christ is the chain breaker. Thirdly, it means we've been transferred from condemnation to forgiveness. In our sins, we deserve the total judgment of God and be cast out into utter darkness, or to be left in utter darkness. But through the work of Christ Jesus, we're forgiven, not because we're good, but because God is good. Because God is good, God is loving, God is forgiving. He looks at us as sinners who are broken and in darkness and sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem us, to forgive us, and set us on a path of life. And finally, it means we move from the grip of Satan into the loving hands of God. As we remain close to Christ day by day, we now have the upper hand over Satan. Satan will always come around and tempt us. He tempted Jesus every day. The four temptations in the book of Matthew gives the impression that Jesus was tempted only at the beginning of his ministry. No, those were examples that Jesus faced throughout his life. We don't always read it throughout the Gospels, but Jesus was being tempted constantly. His, his own disciples were tempted him constantly to go a different way, go a different direction. Go, don't go to Jerusalem. Stay here with us. He was constantly facing temptation. Satan's always on the prowl, as First Timothy tells us, seeking to devour us. That's what Satan's all about. He's always trying to be a disruption in our lives. And the point is, is once we become a Christian, Satan no longer has that power over us. He knows it, but what he wants to do is make us miserable. So he's always tempting us with the things of this world, wanting us to fail, feel terrible about ourselves in our relationship with God, and doubt God's power and love and forgiveness. You see, if Satan cannot keep us from being a child of God, he just simply wants to keep us miserable. And our task as followers of Christ is to turn from him, not allow Satan to steal our joy, our joy of knowing what God has, God has done for us through Jesus Christ. We are a freed people. We are a rescued people. We have been set free from our sins. We have been given the light of Christ. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May we always keep looking up to the cross. Let us always keep looking toward the heavens of the risen Christ. Let us keep looking up for the day when Christ shall return always keeping our eyes on Jesus. He is the one who makes our lives worth living. Jesus, you see, knows the way to life, the way to live. When we listen to his word, his example, his teachings, his sacrifice, when we follow him, we will experience his life in us. I've got to ask you, what could be better than that? I can't think of a thing. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of study. We thank you for Paul's inspiration to write these words. We pray, God, that Jesus Christ will always live in our hearts, guide our thoughts and our minds, our attitudes, and our steps. And may we always walk in favor with you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and have a great day.